I think we're on. Welcome, everybody. <laughs> this is Ari Gerson from Longfellow Books. Um, and we are very excited to welcome Simon Van Boy and Meredith Hall tonight uh, to celebrate the publication of Simon's latest novel, Night Came With Many Stars. Um, the novel follows multiple generations of a Kentucky family beginning in the early 1930s when a fateful card game changed the course of 13-year-old Carol's life forever. Over the course of the novel, as Carol escapes the trauma of her upbringing and embraces her newfound family, we also watch her grandson some 50 years later coming of age with troubles of his own. Simon is the author of four highly acclaimed collections of short stories, four novels, including The Illusion of Separateness, which is a national bestseller, and several books for children. He's the editor of three philosophy books and has written for the New York Times, the Financial Times, the Guardian, the Times, NPR, and the BBC. After attending the University of Kentucky on a football scholarship, he moved to a rural part of the state, and today he calls New York City home, but regularly returns to Kentucky. Meredith Hall is the author of the critically acclaimed novel, Beneficence. Her memoir, Without a Map, is a classic of the genre and a New York Times bestseller. It was named Best Book of the Year by Carcass and Book Sense, as well as Elle's Reader's Peck of the Year. Her, her work has appeared in Five Points, the Gettysburg Review, the Kenyan Review, the Southern Review, the New York Times, and many others. I don't like looking down at a piece of paper, so we are really excited for this conversation. Um, I can't wait to see what, what comes out of it. And um, uh, what I would basically ask everybody is, if you have questions, we'll do a Q&A at the end um, for about 15 or 20 minutes. So you can use the chat uh, section to submit your questions. And, um, and uh, if everybody is, should be on mute, and I would ask that everybody stay on mute. Um, just for the for the conversation so that we can hear these two great writers in conversation um and obviously if you want to purchase a copy <laughs> longfellow books um and with that i'm going to turn it over um and and let these two phenomenal talents go to go to town thank you thanks very much Ari. thanks Ari. hi simon this is such a pleasure hi meredith Congratulations on your new book. I'm very pleased. Thank you. I'm very pleased that it is out in the world. It's a very, very beautiful piece of literature. Well, I'm trying to keep up with you, Meredith. <laughs> so I want to thank Longfellow Books for inviting Simon and allowing me to be part of this conversation and also MWPA for hosting this. Um, and I think we also need to say happy birthday to our beloved uh, editor, Josh Bodwell at Godine. Simon and I share uh, this wonderful editor. And um, so I want to wish happy birthday to Josh. He's not showing himself on the screen. I hope that we're not making him blush. So it's a very nice way to celebrate a birthday, I think. Um, okay, Simon, I have so much that I'd like to talk to you about. I think readers will be very interested in the fact that this is a book that you um, that arose out of friendships and deep relationships with the people that you're writing about. You have um, you have a long, deep familiarity with, and and I suspect a familial kind of relationship with these people. And I've noticed, I think that you did not change their names as you wrote this story. Is that right? Am I right about that? That's correct, yeah. And so I'm very interested in what the intersection is for you as a writer between all of these stories that have been shared with you and the lives that you've witnessed, the lives that you've participated in, and the way a writer makes story I'm very interested in how you navigated that and what the what that intersection is between these very real people that you love um, and share great responsibility to and um, and this this story making you are such a storyteller. 
I was interested as I made some notes about this, I, I asked the question, what has their response been? And what do you, what, as you wrote, what did you feel your responsibilities were? And I realized those are two related word, words, responses and responsibilities. So I'm wondering what that nexus is for you. Um, that's a really good question. In fact, I, I got a text from um, Alfreda uh, tonight saying that her copy had arrived and, um, you know, she just started reading it. And uh, did I know that her aunt's name was Carol? And I didn't know that. So it's a sort of weird coincidence um, because I don't know, I didn't know Alfreda's mother's name. So the, the, the tough thing with this book was um, uh, taking stories that the family had trusted me with um, and then building a kind of a novel, um, building a thread sort of through the those and then looking for where the spaces were for the bits I would have to kind of imagine. Um, so it was, it was because I wasn't told everything chronologically. And when I had questions about things that had happened, often the family didn't know. So there were these big patches of time that I thought I'm going to have to fill those. And, and uh, I tried to fill them with other stories from other families I'd been told in Kentucky. So at least I was always mixing in um, a level of realism uh, into, into the book. So it's sort of a composite, like a lot of the characters are the characters who are not part of the family, are other characters I've known, um, you know, in Kentucky or in when I lived in the Midwest. And how the people, the real people, how did they greet the news that you wanted to create a story out of their family history? Is Let me ask you this, is Alfreda's mother's story uh, a real part of their life? Was that, was that central event uh, true to life or was that uh, work that you created around the story? Um, that, yeah, that, that was true to life. Um, you know, almost 30 years ago when I was a teenager sitting in their kitchen, excuse me, drinking um, Sam's Club orange soda and eating, you know, Jimmy Dean breakfast for sausage, I, um, Alfreda said to me, uh, you know, I, asked, I said, what was your, your father like? And she said, well, um, he, he, he wasn't very nice. And I, I thought I imagined somebody who was a bit mean and, you know, not very emotional. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then she said, well, you know, I don't know how many people he, he killed exactly. And I thought, ooh, I mean, I wasn't, I wasn't writing then. Um, I mean, I was writing poems back then, but I didn't ever think I'd become a novelist or anything. So, but, but that started everything. That sort of, you know, um, uh, released to the kind of the spirit, you know, from the jar. And then over the next 30 years, when I would visit Kentucky, I would get new stories. Um, and, you know, I would get to know the friendship between Sam and myself has, has been long. I mean, he's funny. I, I love him. He's he's like a brother to me, you know. And I remember I went to visit him a couple of years ago, and we went to a uh, we went to the only Chinese restaurant in the area, and they were playing country music. And Sam looked at me and he said, "Well, I think we should go to McDonald's and play Chinese music." <laughs> so I don't moment, think I put that in the book. Yes, that moment changed slightly, but it's in the book. It had to be in the book. Yeah, it's wonderful. Oh, it is in the book. Yes, it is. Okay. Um, yes, so even like little, even like little things he would tell me here and there. You know, I tried to really capture his personality. Then the danger, of course, was to sentimentalize it. Yes. Um, you know, just like if you're writing about somebody you don't like, the the, the danger is to to judge. Uh, because I think the writers, I think Flaubert said that um, the writer should be like God in nature. Sorry, uh, yeah, like God in nature, uh, everywhere present but nowhere visible. Yes, right, right. Well, that's a that's an aspect of your writing I want to come back to this evening. So, um, I wonder if you would. Well, I, I hope if I. 
I was going to say, if, if following on from that analogy, you know, if you, if you do see me um, in the book, I'm popping up like a little mole, like my little head coming out of the ground. I hope I'll just pop back down again. So I hope you don't see me in the novel. I hope you just yeah. see and feel the characters. Yes, and I don't, I don't think that you um, insert yourself into this work at all, Simon. I think it's extraordinarily, uh, it's, I admire very much that you know and love some of these people in your real life, and yet you, you command this story. You are making story, and I admire it very much. I think it's a very seam, seamless move between these real people and your writing. Um, I wondered if maybe this would be a good time. I asked if you would like to do a short reading and I think maybe <clears throat> maybe if you read a little bit, uh, some of these other questions that I have for you might flow from there. Oh yeah, I'd, I'd love to, um, but yeah, thanks. Uh, if nobody minds, I will. I've, I, I actually, I've got everybody cornered, so I think this is a good time to do it. Um, okay. So I just have to, I need like a 12 year old to show me how to work my computer. Hold on. Um, okay, go okay, found it. Um, copyright 2000, I'm just kidding. Okay, let me see. Um, yeah, that's what they do on, on books on tape, don't they? They, they read everything. Um, okay. Carol, 1933. After checking for his truck in the front yard, Carol hurried downstairs to scour the cupboards for some breakfast. She sang because the house was empty. Her voice filled each room like invisible writing. Finally, under the stairs in a crate hidden by some model tea tires, she discovered flour in a round tin the government had given them last year. She carried it to the kitchen table then went outside to the well, still barefoot and moving quickly through the wet, nodding grass and green weeds. Carol knew the water was cold from how the rope smelled in her hands. The water glugged from a black pool fed by a slow river that was even deeper than the bones of her grandpa, who had died in a ploughed field with no sound, just a quick folding up into the brown waves. Carol could hardly speak then, but she remembered the body being brought to the house with his face the colour of winter. Her father sold the land after that, put down the old man's tools and picked up a bottle, a deck of cards, a gun when necessary. Carol hauled the full bucket inside, trying not to spill. Her daddy would return soon and like a dark spirit see through every fallen drop as if each were an eye and her life a succession of small glaring mistakes. She'd woken up hungry with the desire for an egg, but the chickens were long gone. A scar on her back proved it. Sometimes Carol reached around and fingered the scar, pushed on the memory knitted beneath. The hen house door had been left open and coyotes got in. The morning her father had found it empty, he yanked and ripped at the coop like, until it rose like a stiff net. There was spit whipping from his mouth as he pulled at the frame, snapping thin ribs of wood. Carol had squeezed into a kitchen cupboard where she could smell the sweat from behind her knees. She thought about crawling under the porch, but the darkness there, the rotting planks and those limp, eyeless creatures roaming the damp soil was terror of a different kind. When her daddy came to a wood slap that wouldn't break, his rage changed course and he followed it into the house, eyes churning with fury. That was years ago now, though Carol still liked to imagine the coyote's glowing eyes with careful, sorry, Carol still liked to imagine the coyote's eyes glowing with careful intent as they carried her father's birds wet in their mouths to a place more smell than touch. Um, if it's okay with everybody, I'd like to read a, a little bit from deeper in the book, just um, because uh, there's a there's a scene um, that I, I quite enjoyed writing. And um, so let me go to, uh, it's sort of a love scene, actually. 
Um, so any, if anybody likes a bit of romance, you might like this. Um, and, and the chapters go back and forth in time. Um, I, don't, I mean, for those of you who haven't read it, uh, uh, which can quickly be remedied, by the way, at Longfellow Books, um, uh, the, the chapters start in 1933, and then the second chapter, I think, is 1986. So it's about 50 years apart. Um, and I wanted to show childhood in America 50 years apart. So we see a 13 year old Carol in 1933, and then we see a 13 year old Samuel in 1986. And then it continues like that, showing these two childhoods um, until everything converges about halfway through the book and we meet in sort of present time, so to speak. Um, Okay, let me find this part. I'm skipping through a PDF. Uh, okay, here we go. Um, and when um, when Carol falls in love and meets the person she'll marry, um, I also, you know, her grandson, I also show that scene. So um, there's traces of, of this old America, I think, everywhere in the South. Uh, when I first moved to Kentucky in the 90s, I mean, Main Street was like, it was like a sort of 1950s movie set that was completely abandoned. There were even 1950s cars that would, were parked and hadn't been touched for 30, 40 years. Um, so, and some of the mannequins in the shops, they... Um, uh, they were like 1950s mannequins in 1950s clothes. So I feel like, you know, from the architecture, you could tell that some of these towns, they'd peaked, you know, in maybe the 1940s during the war. And then since then, they just sort of gone down. And then I suppose when factories were moved overseas, um, that was sort of the death knoll. Um, so, okay, so this is a scene in a diner that I remember from when I, I lived down there. And um, it was um, open all night, sort of like um, Edward Hopper's Nighthawks. So this chapter is called Heather and it's 1999. An hour before closing, the restaurant was already empty. Heather went from table to table, turning over clean coffee cups one by one, then laying down paper placemats when that was done, she sat at the counter and wrapped silverware in paper napkins, fastening each bundle with a sticker. Her feet hurt, but she'd soon be in the car drive going home. She could take her shoes off then and drive barefoot through the darkness. It was Halloween night and the dining room was decorated with ghosts, ghouls and witches' hats. Alone with empty tables, Heather wondered if there were real ghosts and if they watched people. She once found an envelope when cleaning out a cupboard in the supply closet. It was a pack of photographs from New Year's Eve 1957. When she saw the people in those pictures, Heather knew their lives had come and gone. Those who had lived out their days in the town would now be in the cemetery with tiny snapping American flags in the ground over where they were buried. The waitresses in the photographs had matching green dresses. The men wore dark suits or overalls, carried burning cigarettes. Many years ago, there had been a factory nearby and the town was prosperous. Heather wondered if the people in the pictures sensed their time of abundance would pass. Or did every day seem new and unbreakable? The hardest thing about getting old, a customer once warned her, was always being shocked by the face staring back at you in the mirror. When Marvin appeared from the kitchen, he was wearing a satin Louisville Cardinals jacket over his baggy kitchen whites. He was a tall, deliberate man with a slow but confident way of speaking. He carried several white containers in a plastic bag, most likely French fries for his children. In his other hand was a box of menthol cigarettes and a plastic lighter held together with a rubber band. I'm taking off, Heather. I closed the kitchen and left a piece of Salisbury steak in full for your mama. You're a sweetheart, Marvin. I love you. Okay, don't forget it now. 
I won't. Happy Halloween. If Clyde sees it, then I know, Marvin, I won't forget. I promise. How's she doing anyway? Mama, she's okay. She misses him. We all do. Turn to go. Want me to flip sign on the door? No need. I'm right behind you. But there were still things to do. And the sudden quiet was strange and penetrating, as though in the absence of people, Heather felt them more. She climbed onto a stool and held open the pie's cabinet's plastic door with her elbow sweeping crumbs from the clear shelves. Heather felt she had learned a lot from being a waitress. There were regulars she knew by name, others by face. Some of the old ladies couldn't eat without shaking and making a mess. The other waitresses made fun, but Heather knew coming to Booth's diner was all they had left. Some of the ladies spent hours getting ready, pasting on makeup, choosing what to wear. Heather guessed it was too hard being at home. The rooms once full of people were now just full of voices calling to them from far away. Some of the old men had crushes on Heather. She knew it. It was awkward at first. They called her Red or Hot Top. But since it never went beyond harmless comments about her hair or leaving an extra dollar, she just didn't have the heart to humiliate them. One of the men who came in every day was named Hale Bennett. When he didn't show up for his usual grits two mornings in a row, Heather called the senior home and they told her he would be in the hospital from now on. The next day she visited, took his favorite breakfast in a cardboard box. Seeing him hooked up to machines with only a few days to go, she felt very emotional and went back the next night and the one after that. She expected to see other people, but she was the only one. When he passed, Heather was holding his hand. She didn't feel like a waitress anymore, but his late wife, a high school sweetheart, or perhaps a long dead mother, some final chance for him to die, still holding the thread of his life. Thank you. I think that's I've tortured you enough, especially with my bizarre accent, which is supposed to be Southern, but it probably sounds like I'm from, um, you know, Hawaii or something. Oh, I, I disagree with you. Clearly, this is a, uh, a voice. This is a way of speaking that's inside your cells now, Simon. You can hear it. So it's very interesting to me that you chose um, both of those passages because a lot of what I'm interested in is the, it seems to me that what you write about in the, all the work that I've read is love and the great human hunger, the necessity of love and what happens, how, how we break when we don't receive that love that we need and the grace of love, what happens when we, when we are sufficiently loved. And your characters in this book um, are, are both loved and not loved. So we meet Carol, who is, um, by the time she's 13, she is facing a really a terrible, a devastating past and future. And the interesting thing is you tuck inside a pocket for her, her memory of her mother's love for her from when she was a very young child. So Carol, in spite of the, uh, the trauma surrounding her father, um, when she's a 13 year old girl, she remembers her mother loving her. Still, she goes into her life hungering for love. And she interestingly finds it initially from Bessie and Martha in this almost um, surreal environment that she lands in, this deeply, deeply loving uh, outsider home. And, um, and then, we watch Eddie, who is facing a, a childhood and a youth, loveless, and uh, he knows those hungers. He says at one point that he's always on the verge of being loved, that he never is loved, except for Samuel, his closest friend. And Samuel not only loves him very much, but Samuel knows how to love Eddie. He knows what the quality of that love is. 
So I'm very interested in how, it, whether, whether this is um, built into your characters, whether this, this interest in love and our need for it and the failures of love and the costs of that, whether that is for you as you write and not just in this book, um, if it's simply built into the characters, this is how you understand us or if it's um, something that you choose to circle and focus on? Mm, very good question. Um, well, I, I, uh, in a way, I suppose um, it's just what comes out because writing for me is very instinctual. So I can't, I can't always say, I mean, people are constantly explaining my stories to me. <laughs> um, you know, they talk to me about them. And I'm like, oh yeah, that is true. Wow, that's true. You know, I like that. I, I think, yeah, I'll say that from now on when anyone when anyone asks. Uh, but I really, I really feel like, um, you know, sort of idiotic, really, because um, so much is just un unintended. Uh, you know, I just sit down and I write, and I sort of, I don't go into a trance, you know, but um, I lose myself. And then I find that four or five hours have passed. And I'm really tired. And then hopefully when I go back to it, it's okay. It's something at least I can work with and edit. So, um, I mean, a lot of um, writers I know, their characters have amazing lives and then things go wrong because of bad luck or infidelity or, you know, uh, illness. But I feel like in Simon world, like everything's just really bad. It, it's the default position is like, is suffering and despair. And we have to pull ourselves out of it. I mean, um, I mean, I suppose in, 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 in medi the medieval times, if somebody woke up and they weren't hungry or in pain, they'd be like, what's happening? You know, something weird is going on. Like I don't have any pain in my body. So I, I sort of have that medieval mentality Whereas if I wake up and there's there's no terrible crisis, um, I can't believe it. It's amazing. Um, so yes, I, it's that, that, that Oscar Wilde quote, you know, about being in the gutter, but just you may as well look at the stars. <laughs> yes, but I would say, Simon, I, I understand what you're saying, but it also seems to me that there is a very, uh, you carry a deep, and tender um, valuing of love. It's almost, it's almost a romantic, and I don't mean a romanticizing, but a romantic view of love in many ways. Love, in the end, if anything is going to rescue your characters, it is going to be love, being, feeling love and uh, giving love over to people. It's, um, I'm, I'm also yeah. very interested in the ways I've spoken to you about this before. It seems to me that you reveal yourself on the page in a, just in an extraordinary way. It's an extraordinarily generous thing you do because it feels to the reader that Simon Van Boy is um, allowing us to enter him and read him in, a, in a, the deepest way. I wanted to uh, read back to you two lines that I found fascinating. Um, one is- These are, these are very nice uh, things you're saying, Meredith. These are very nice things you're saying. I promise I'm gonna, I'm making notes. I'm gonna pass them all on to the person who writes that I don't really know. You know, some like, like strange I, creature I, that like- I get that. Just so, uses me, you know? Yes, I get that completely. And it means that you were surprised when I pointed out to you that something was in the book and you're turning to that other guy saying, oh, you put that in the book? I didn't realize you had done that. Um, so this is a conversation between very young Carol and Martha. And Martha, uh, Carol says, ain't it strange how love can lead so quickly to pain? And Martha says, it's not love that does this, but you're right. All love leads to pain of one kind or another. It's amazing. Uh, it's something I can't understand. And very shortly after that, so Martha is saying all love leads to pain of one kind or another. And just a few pages after that, Samuel is with the dancer in the club and the dancer says, 
it still amazes me that so much pain can lead to so much love. It's something I don't understand. And you reverse yourself there. Pain leads to love yeah. and love leads to pain. What's that? Well, I, do, I think if there's, if there's no pain, it, it's probably not worth it. Um, you know, unless you can be Buddhist about it and you can, you can love without being attached. Um, you know, you can love in a way where, you, you know, you don't suffer. But, um, but for me personally, I just think it's worth, it's worth suffering. You know, because everyone I, I love, I'm going to lose or they're going to lose me. At some point, it's just going to happen. But they're going they're, they're going to lose Simon, is what I mean. But I'm not really Simon. What I mean is, there's a there's a person who thinks he's Simon, and you know he walks around thinking people are talking to to him, but they're not. They're talking to Simon. You see, but there's something beyond Simon, and I think it's that. Whatever it is, I'm in Vienna now, so they might say like Geist, that kind of like spirit um does all the work and that spirit whether it's a spirit or a soul or an essence or something you know that that it's not to be confused with simon because simon's temporary so um so i suppose when you realize that you realize that there's not you don't really lose that much um do you see what i mean it's a it's very hard because I'll I'll go off on a tangent and I'll completely lose the thread of what we're talking about. I'm resisting that right now. Um, <laughs> Let me. But we won't be able to find our way back there if, <laughs> if we go off on one. <laughs> so let me pull you back with this. Carol, at the very end of her life, returns to her, the house in which so much harm was done to her as a child. Her grandson yes. now owns it, and it's been completely transformed. And uh, if we have time, I'd like to talk about home and what that means. But for the moment, I was caught when Carol says she's lost her beloved husband. And she says quietly, with great calm, I guess we'll just have to wait our turn on the wheel until we come around again when he's, when he's ours again. I'm paraphrasing that. But I was so struck with this sense that she, that, uh, Joe is ever present for her, and yet he is he is gone. She feels confident that he will be part of her life again. Yeah, okay, I'm, yeah, exactly. All right. So a few years ago, I I was um, um, you know, somebody was telling me how they a love affair had ended and um, and they were devastated. And this person said that, you know, they, they would mope through life without this person. And they just didn't feel like they'd ever be able to live with this person. And I, I went home with that sort of heaviness, you know, feeling bad for that friend. Uh, and then I imagined that maybe 10 years, this person's life has just rolled sort of sourly along. And, um, and then there's a homeless person who, who says, you know, can you help me? Do you have any change? Or, can you get me some food? And this person is so consumed still with their grief after a decade that they just ignore this person. But what if that person begging was the person who had broken up with them 10 years before and they didn't recognize them because the person looked physically different? Maybe they'd become a, a drug addict, you know, or maybe they just look different. So how can you claim to love somebody if you would completely walk? So that's not really love or, or is love dependent on what you can see? So therefore, like, it just struck me that, um, it struck me that um, that can't be love, that's stimulation. You see, so, so then what, it, what, it, what is love? Well, if you can't rely on the eyes to determine whether you're in love, you have to rely on something else. And if, if that person, then if, if you say that someone's died and, and maybe I think in some cultures they believe that the energy goes into a different body so then if you're, um, if you're, um, if you want to love somebody, then you have to be prepared to love everybody. Otherwise, it's a bit of a sham. Because then otherwise, you're basing love on, on that recognizing the person's body in a weird way. And then, it, you know, and then you ask yourself the question of what is a person anyway? Is it the sum total of experience? 
mixed with a bit of like, you know, um, nature, you know, DNA. And, um, and, and if somebody lost their memory um, and they, they, would they still love the person who they forgot? So then does love depend on memory? So there's a lot of problems with love, I think. A lot of like, you know, we, I, we could go down different roads and discuss it and analyze it. But um, my, my, my conclusion was that if I'm not prepared to love everybody, then I can't possibly love anybody. Uh, because I don't know what's going on behind the curtain. You see what I mean? <laughs> Meredith, you might be my, you might, you might be my father from another time. I might be, you see, we just don't know anything. So, um, so that's, that's sort of where I'm going in a sense, um, with, so with the sense is, of how I feel love is. But this is very interesting. I told you it was a tangent. I warned you. Well, it's, it's really lovely. First of all, it interests me to hear you speak about love in this way because you write love uh, with these characters as a very mundane, um, home-based. It's a, a love is domestic. It's um, it's tangible. It's uh, it's quiet and non-dramatic, and it's not philosophical. These, these your characters feel love and need love and uh, soak up love. Um, in a way that is simply in today, it's in the moment. So I'm interested in that. The other thing is, this leads directly to one of the things I wanted to talk to you about, which is your extraordinary degree of compassion for these people. In all the characters that I've read, uh, that you've put on the page, you bring such incredible compassion. Um, Carol's father. So each of these characters, Carol uh, does not, she has um, not an admirable relationship uh, with her young son, Rusty. He's an imperfect child and she has a very hard time accepting him. And she says mm. later, um, she, she admits to Samuel, her grandson, we've had a lot of hard times. Um, and uh, we have Eddie, who is such a flawed character, he's murdered somebody and has done other violent things. And yet you uh, instruct us page by page by page to love these people and to feel great compassion for them. I thought as I reread this book this week that the one character you do not ask us to bring compassion to is Carol's father, who is virtually irredeemable. And you don't ask us uh, to make a leap, I think we would find very difficult. But you do have Carol express tenderness about him very late in her life. And it's not an explicit statement of forgiveness or compassion, but there's a softness there that surprises us at the very end of her life. But except for this father who is really questionable, you're, you bring uh, just almost an aching compassion to the people that you've written. So is that compassion arising out of that sense that you have that anybody might be anybody in our lives? I, th I think so. I mean, it, you know, I, it's, it's really a belief that I've, I've, it has incorporated incorporated itself into my life because the thing is like you know say that someone I love dies and they're lost from me as I knew them in the universe and you know and we'll never and then I die and we'll never see each other again you know that the thought of that is chilling that someone who's dead and I don't mean a person I also mean a dog or a cat because animals are people too in my opinion and so when they're out there, you wonder they're in the universe. Like, what are they doing? Like, what's happening? Where are they? And um, and if if energy, we know from physics, energy doesn't go anywhere. It simply changes form. Nothing leaves. Everything's here, and it's constantly metamorphosizing into something else. So there's evidence that things metamorphosize and come back. So then the thing is. You know, the, the daughter I have now, who I love so dearly in this life, 
maybe the daughter from another time or a son from another time is here right now, maybe even in this Zoom. And they're not lost, they're here. I just don't recognize them because when we die, we don't really die, we just lose memory. Memory is the great deceiver. Um, you see, so in order to love my daughter now and, and not feel like I'm gonna lose her, I have to be prepared to love everybody and have compassion for them because they might be the daughter from before. Do you see what I mean? Yes, I certainly do. And I feel like just through, you know, doing a few things on with pen and paper with a bit of logic, that that soon actually becomes very clear. Um, you know, of course, somebody like Adolf Hitler, like Carol's father, you know, is irredeemable. Um, so I don't know what to do. I mean, there are people in this world who are, we might consider irredeemable. I wouldn't want to be the one to judge them. No, but you I know. admire very much um, as a writer that you presented this character of Carol's father and um, did not, you placed no expectation on your reader whatsoever that we would contend with any obligation to uh, forgive or, or extend compassion to him. So I have one, one more question. This idea of memory, uh, it strikes me that this family carries Carol's history until it seems to me, once Samuel and his wife buy Carol's childhood home, the site of so much pain and completely transform it. I, I realized reading that as the family gathers in this place, Samuel, his wife, his children, um, not certain about his mother, Alfredia, but certainly from Samuel and Heather and their children on down, that history is forgotten. It's gone. They don't know what happened to Carol in that house. They don't know what that truck means. They don't know uh, what the yellow cloth means. They don't know what her memory of the corner of the barn means. Um, and so I'm interested in, it's it seems to me a gift that is allowed through generations that uh, painful stories are forgotten, that they're, that they're allowed to lie. Yeah, I think mercifully they're lost, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it was Freud who said that, um, you know, if we don't remember the past, we're doomed to repeat it, you know. Uh, and I think there's a line somewhere, what's past is prefaced. I can't remember where it comes from. It might be from a Shakespeare play. Everything usually comes from a Shakespeare play. I think it is Shakespeare, what's past is prefaced. It might be The Tempest, I'm not sure. But, um, but yeah, I mean, I, again, I think um, memory is this great deceiver. But when I remember, when I say to my wife, oh, we had a great time, didn't we? When we went to like friendlies, and had that breakfast after the, and she said, no, you're miserable. You just criticized the food the whole time. You know, I, I don't remember that. And um, so I feel like when we remember things and I was driving across America with my daughter and she said to me the other day, you know, it wasn't that fun. And I was like, really? I didn't think you like it. You just wanted to stop at every Walmart. And um, she was like, no, no, I liked it. So I realized that often we remember things as being like much better than they were at the time, which is quite nice. Uh, it's a small mercy. Um, but of course, the flip side is that if we're a victim of a violent event, then we often memory just keeps replaying that or almost as though memory is trying to protect us, you know, so that we analyze things so that it's less likely to happen again. So. I think we can all be, at some point in our lives, we sometimes become prisoners of memory. You know, memory becomes a jailer. We have to get out of replaying a memory over and over again, something we did or maybe that was done to us. And that's why I'm a great believer. And I mentioned Freud, but I do really think therapy is, um, Sounds like a message from the American Therapy Association. Well, um, yeah, but uh, yeah. so I don't know. I, I'm, go, I'm about to go off on another strange tangent, Mer Meredith, so you better step in. I, I was actually, uh, actually going to step in. There are some questions from some, um, some, some viewers. Um, are, are, you, are you two ready to take some questions? Absolutely. 
Thank you. Larry. Yeah, I'm sorry for bringing, for bringing Hitler into it. No, no, no. And I, I, think it, I, I, I thought it was very funny that uh, you, uh, you, you just made a comment about that, uh, like, there might be the next daughter on the Zoom, for all I know. And I just went up and, 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 and picked up my three week old. So <laughs> it was a very uh, prescient uh, comment. Um, in any case, it's wonderful uh, to see you together. Yeah. <laughs> yes, it is. She's 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 being introduced to literature at a young age. She changes everything too, doesn't she? Everything about the evening. It's lovely, Ari. Look uh, at how she's looking at him. Yeah. I mean, that is adoration. Yes, that's right. No, that's that's I just pooped. <laughs> uh, all right, you want? I'm gonna hand her off. Um, so we have a question from Alice. Um, your writing is instinctual. How do you get started on a new story and what is your inspiration? Um, well, getting started on a new story isn't that, isn't that hard because it just requires me to, to spend time alone and not be distracted by like my phone or by, you know, not even have a book with me, but just to go for a walk or maybe go away for a couple of days. Could be anywhere. It could be like a small town in Alabama. It could be Alaska. It could be somewhere in Europe. Just go away and just walk around and do nothing. It sounds like a good life, doesn't it? But it's actually, you know, and then just wait for some, just wait for some, um, for something to grip you. What I mean is, uh, um, you know, I was in a diner in, Virginia and um, the waitress was pregnant and uh, you know we had a conversation about life and things like that and there was something about her and the way she put the blueberries into the plastic bowl that I just thought I thought was very beautiful and I thought yeah she's 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 a character she's going to become a character um, so you know or other times you might um, just have a strange interaction with somebody you know, I was I went to Las Vegas, and um, I don't gamble and I don't drink. So what do I do there? I mean, I just basically just walk around looking suspicious. Um, and uh, I saw a, a little boy sitting outside the casino, and his mother was saying, you, "You know, your father will be out in just a second. He just has to win our money back. He'll be out in a second. We need the money for our hotel tonight." You know. And the boy was so hot and his face was red from the heat. And I just wondered like, what, what's his life gonna be? And they weren't from there, you could tell by their accent. Um, and one of his socks had come off and was sitting uh, next to his little leg and it had dinosaurs on it. And I thought that that's a story, you know. I, I, so you wait, you just walk around and do nothing and you wait for something to grip you, something to pinch. Like to, to like lasso your heart in a, in a weird way. I mean, your proverbial heart, you know, because what that thing is, is something that relates back to an event in your life. You may not know it, but everything you see that is emotional for you is a form of autobiography. And then so by writing it and by teasing it onto the page, you're also writing your story. And so that's all you have to do. Just all you have to do is be, emo but then, to be emotionally open, you can't just do it when you go for a walk, when you go to like, you know, you wander about the mall. It, you have to do it in every part of your life. And then that leads to other things, you know. So, but you can't, you can't always be in writing mode, you know, in everyday life. When you're at Stop and Shop, you know, deciding whether you should get, you know, one of the mushrooms, like, uh, I don't know what the kinds of mushrooms are, but the giant one or the little ones. You can't be in writer mode then, you know, you're in shopping mode but so when you get into writer mode it's a bit different and I feel like you know you you find something in life that penetrates and then you give yourself solitude where you can get into writer mode that's where you escape your life so that's what I mean when I say Simon shops for mushrooms at stop and shop or usually buys rotten ones for some reason but um, so that's not the Simon who writes Simon goes into a small room and he disappears and what's left is what writes. And that's why I really can't take responsibility. I'm more of a Cody of the 
thing that writes. You know, I, I make the tea and clean up after. Uh, and that's really how it feels. I'm a representative of the book um, because I can't, I can't, you know, I'm not, I mean, what I mean to say is that um, without, try, without getting boring, more boring, is that, um, I mean, I'm from Britain and I, I don't know that, I don't know very much. And so this story about people in Kentucky who people have written to me already and said, you know, this is the story of also my family. I mean, how could I have written that? I'm just an idiot who grew up in Britain, um, you know, where everyone voted for Brexit. So it's got to be something else. There's something mystical going on. But I think I've got to lose myself in order to get in touch with it, if that makes any sense. I think that's, I think that's actually a really good segue to the next question, um, which uh, from Christine, which is, what did you discover in writing this book that is different than discoveries you've made in the past writings you've done? Oh, yeah, that's a good question too. Um, I made a lot of discoveries, or Simon did, because Simon does the editing. Um, so he does do something, um, you know, he's not just sitting around going for walks. Um, yeah, so Simon does the editing and he tries to reveal more of what comes out in that first stage of writing. So I think Simon learned a lot from that, uh, from editing this book, um, transitions. Also, when 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 you write too much and it weakens what you already have. So I used to think that you would only cut bad writing in the editing process, but the fact is, you actually have to cut a lot of good writing because otherwise you've got too much. I mean, you can't have Indian and Greek food on the same plate; they clash. Okay. Um, so you've got to decide. So sometimes you have to get rid of good writing in order to make the good writing that's there, you know, to enhance it. So that the energy from the writing you take away is stays on the page. So I learned, I learned about that. Um, I also learned, um, yeah, so really a lot of craft stuff I learned from this novel. Um, yeah, it was quite interesting, editing stuff. So, um, so actually that, that sort of segues into, I think uh, that's the last uh, audience question, but I have a question and it, and it, it sort of coincides, I think. Um, I'm curious about, um, you talked er very early on about how you started out as a poet or writing poetry and then, and then, you know, and then moved into uh, um, uh, a novelist. How, how do you think, how do you think starting as a poet, I, I find your writing very lyrical. Um, and, um, and I'm, I'm curious how, how that's, how that's influenced, how you think that progression influenced you in, in some way. Hmm. Well, you know, I started off loving First World War poetry when I was a child. I didn't grow up in a literary house. Um, there were a lot of books um, in the house, but they were mostly thrillers with, about the British RAF and the British SAS during World War II. So I grew up on a lot, lot of military, military uh, kinds of um, Frederick Forsyth, stuff like that. Um, but then in school, I heard Dulce et Decorum Est by Wilfred Owen, and I, I couldn't believe it. I just, I didn't understand what it meant. Um, the whole poem, you know, forget the Latin. I didn't even understand what the English words meant. I couldn't understand, you know, um, you know bent double like beggars under sacks. You know, I, what is that? But there was something about the sound and the rhythm that was like a kind of indelible music that just penetrated me. And, um, and then I got on to Siegfried Sassoon and Rupert Brooke. And, um, you know, and I, I didn't even know when the First World War was. It could have been in the Wild West. It could have been in Wyoming for all I knew back then. But um, something about the sound of it was both serious and at the same time, not serious. But um, I just couldn't shake it. And then all through my life, you know, I've tried other jobs. I'm not very good at them been fired a lot. Um, I took my exams to be a banker at UBS Payne Weber. Um, 
and thank God I didn't go into that. And um, but um, I mean, not no disrespect to anyone who does it, but uh, it wasn't for me. So writing was the only thing I could really do with heart and soul. Sounds like an eighties song, doesn't it? I think it is actually. <laughs> yeah, it, might, it might be. Um, well, um, this has been phenomenal and I am so grateful to you, Simon and Meredith. Um, I want to, I want to give some thanks to the main writers and publishers Alliance for co-sponsoring this, um, and, and hosting the zoom, uh, is, um, it's, a, it's a, it's a gorgeous book and, um, and all of our congratulations go out to you and, um, and we really just look forward to one day seeing you in person. <laughs> that would be wonderful. And, and Meredith's book, latest book too, Beneficence, will literally stop and start your heart. And you better have an AED on standby because it's a very powerful book um, that, you know, I've already put into Mylar and it's on the top shelf where sunlight can't even touch it. Um. <laughs> Thank you, Simon. So I want to also, in closing, encourage everybody, if you have not read Simon's book, order it through Longfellow Books. And if you already own a copy, why don't you order a few copies to give as gifts to the people that you care about? Longfellow Books says- And then gets a couple of his coasters. Yeah. You know, they, <laughs> and then some to use as a step. <laughs> Thank you, Ari. Thank you, Meredith. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, Joshua. everybody, for joining tonight. This has been really fun and uh, can't wait for the next time. Yeah. Bye. Thank you. Okay. Bye, Bye everyone. everyone.